Hi, my name is Sharon Chen. I'm a pediatric infectious disease physician. And this overview about virology and viruses is filled with concepts that we specifically chose for its relevance to clinical medicine. This is part two in our Evolve virus as part of our introduction to microbiology. This video is on the pathogenesis and virulence of viruses. The learning objectives are to discuss the factors that enable a virus to cause disease, or pathogenesis, to discuss the factors that determine the relative capacity of a virus to cause disease, or virulence, and to recognize that viral pathogenesis and virulence are determined by both the virus and the host immune response. Now you'll remember this picture of the virus life cycle, and this image shows you how a virus replicates itself. But what it doesn't show you is how the virus is intricately linked to the host and how the virus causes disease. Now all the viral replication takes place in a host with an immune system that's trying to defend against the virus, and the virus then tries to survive by modulating, escaping, and hiding from the immune system. The combination of viruses replicating and the host immune defenses against them causes clinically apparent damage to the host. And this is what we call disease. So you can see this in the picture we're showing you here. This is a little girl with smallpox, and she has these characteristic poxes on her skin, lots of them. And this is a result of both the smallpox replicating and her immune response to the virus. Now, viral pathogenesis can be determined by several factors, and I'm going to go through each one of these. So first is how a virus interacts with a specific host cell. Disease manifestations in a human is dictated by the specific host cell that the virus attaches and enters. So for example, influenza virus, so that's the cartoon image you see on the slide, attaches to sialic acid residues on the glycoproteins of the host epithelial cells. So something as small as a sugar residue, so that little blue uh, circle, uh, determines which cells influenza can attach and enter. The second determination is how the virus interacts with the immune system. And this has multiple concepts. The first is the idea of viral immune escape. One main mechanism of escaping from the immune system is to change what the immune cells recognize. And the immune cells recognize pieces of protein called antigens. HIV is a great example of the tremendous amount of antigenic variation that occurs during its replication. So the image shows you antigenic variation of HIV in red compared to influenza virus in black. Although the image shows a relatively small amount of uh, antigen variation for influenza, these antigen changes necessitate a change in the seasonal influenza vaccine year to year. Development of a HIV vaccine continues to be a challenge. The next interaction with the immune system that the virus does is to immune modulate or immune evade. Viruses depend on and co-evolved with the host. Remember, I told you already that viruses are obligate intracellular parasites. So for successful propagation, viruses have to overcome this host immune defense. And essentially, viruses have evolved mechanisms to modulate and evade almost every aspect of the host immune system. So for example, when cells are infected with a virus, a key first-line antiviral defense is to produce and release interferons. This is a type of cytokine. Now, interferons will then signal their neighboring uninfected cells to put up their defenses against an oncoming viral infection. And that includes undergoing apoptosis. What viruses do is to block or inhibit these interferons, and it also blocks apoptosis of the cell, and this allows the virus to complete its replication cycle. The last example and concept I want to give you about how viruses interact with the immune system to cause pathogenesis is to avoid the immune surveillance. So one strategy that viruses use uh, is to hide in a location that has low immune surveillance, and that means uh, controlling by immune cells. So an example I can give you is varicella zoster virus, which hides in the dorsal root ganglion. And viruses like varicella zoster virus hide in these locations so they're able to persist, which means they can reactivate later. Varicella zoster virus leaves the dorsal root ganglion, traveling in the sensory nerves that innervate the skin, 
and this produces a really painful vesicular rash, which allows the virus to then exit and then spread to another host. One important uh, way of viral pathogenesis is determined by the host immune response. And the host immune response alone can actually cause pathology. So in the chest x-ray that I'm showing you here uh, is of a patient who has acute lung injury and actually has acute respiratory distress syndrome, or ARDS. And why this happens is, is because of a runaway immune response from a lot of pro-inflammatory cytokines. And these cytokines then recruit all these immune cells to the airways and increase swelling of the airways and then fills it all up with all this cellular debris and fluid. And all of that causes respiratory failure. And there are certain respiratory viruses that can induce this type of clinical picture. And so some examples would be the 2009 pandemic H1N1 and also the SARS coronavirus. Lastly, viral pathogenesis can actually be determined by cellular transformation. So what this means is the virus is causing a cell to replicate aberrantly uh, and allows the virus to persist. Now this can lead to uncontrolled cellular replication and potentially form tumors. And in fact, that's what you're seeing in this picture of this little boy with a bulging eye. Uh, it actually represents Burkitt's lymphoma. And this cancer is caused by EBV transforming B cells. It's very important to note that inducing cancer is a side effect. It is not what the virus actually wants to accomplish. The virus does not need to induce cancer to propagate. We've been talking a lot about how viruses cause disease or pathogenesis, but not why some viruses cause more disease than others. And this is a concept of virulence. Viral virulence is the relative capacity to cause damage in the host. And it's determined by both the virus and the host. Now this last sentence should sound very familiar to you because it's exactly what I said about pathogenesis. Pathogenesis and virulence are dependent on both the actions of the virus and the host immune response. So let me illustrate the idea of relativity of virulence to you with this example. You can see this woman, she is working in a BSL-4 lab uh, and working on Ebola virus, which is why she has to wear this particular blue suit. So if she was not wearing this blue suit, uh, she would be at risk and could be infected with Ebola virus and potentially die. However, the same Ebola virus can fulfill its entire viral life cycle in this fruit bat without causing the bat any symptoms or disease. In virology, the determinant of virulence is predominantly based on viral genetics, with a focus on mutations in viral genes. Different strains of virus may have different virulence because of the mutations in these genes. So this could result in changes to viral replication. For example, higher replication rates may be associated with higher virulence. These mutations could also change the way the virus spreads. So if, you have, if the virus can disseminate, that may be associated with higher virulence. Mutations can also change the way the host responds to the virus. A mutated virus may be able to decrease the host defense against it. This is the idea of the virus modulating the host immune response. Now, the host can actually affect viral virulence. The same virus may cause more damage in a immune compromised host compared to one who is immune competent. So for example, cytomegalovirus or CMV causes terrible damage to the brain, liver, and other organs in a fetus who is infected, but it is completely asymptomatic in a two-year-old little girl. So you can see in this picture, this baby has congenital CMV infection, she's quite sick, and you can see the very large liver, uh, which is outlined. Although much focus is on virus with, viruses with increased virulence, the concept of reduced virulence is equally important. This is called attenuation and is the conceptual basis for many live viral vaccines. This little girl who is uh, pictured is getting the oral polio vaccine. This is a live but attenuated virus, so it will replicate in her intestine, inducing an immune response, but won't cause her any disease.